Hey, welcome everybody to, uh, I think this is our third video episode of Litecoin Underground Podcast. Uh, today we've got Tara Anison on our show. She is, I don't know, I'm going to call her my new tech guru. <laughs> but, uh, but as you guys know, every episode we do on the podcast and the videos are brought to you by Cake Wallet. If you uh, don't know anything about Cake Wallet, you should go check it out. It's a non-custodial, uh, non-KYC wallet where you can hold bitcoin litecoin and monero and if you what's really cool about it is you can even trade or swap in between those assets um and and uh, not have to give up all sorts of information which tara's a big fan of apparently so uh but yeah go check it out there in the app store or just go to cakewallet.com uh okay so i came to know who you were tara because of an article you wrote on it was that and it went on linkedin but then it's been put in some other places as well I'm new to finding out LinkedIn as a, as a place where people are discussing crypto these days. But, um, you know, to be honest with you, there's been kind of a, a desert of information, I'll call it, around Mimblewimble, because I think there's it's maybe a pretty confusing thing to understand. And so I you know reached out to you and we are in different time zones. So it took a little time to get this all sorted. But uh, uh, thank you for coming in. And uh, why don't you give me just a quick like, background to who you are and how you got into crypto and what you spend your day doing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I uh, got into crypto because I did uh, maths at university, so maths and philosophy. And in my third year, there was a cryptography module, so very much like the background of, of crypto and Bitcoin. And my lecturer just offhand mentioned this thing called a blockchain and Bitcoin. And for some reason, it just kind of like yeah, it tickled something interesting. So I did a bit of research, uh, got the white paper, and I was a third year math student at the time. So it actually made a lot of sense to me. The maths uh, in Bitcoin is kind of beautifully simple. And mm -hmm. so even as a yeah, third year math student, I could understand quite a lot of it and uh, just loved it. Loved the idea of like this new financial system kind of for the people, by the people that didn't have centralized control. I, you know, didn't, I kind of grew up through the global financial crisis, but was very much like a child at the time. So mm -hmm. saw it was bad, but didn't really understand why. And then I joined uh, a bank fresh out of uni, very much, you know, good salary. So I was like, yep, yeah, that seems the like the enemy, thing to do. The enemy. Yeah, exactly. Well, I just kind of quickly started working <laughs> no, and I was kidding. like, is this, is this what finance is? Like, I'm not really sure I'm keen on this. And so I kind of became like the graduate running around the bank, just saying like, oh, have you guys heard of Bitcoin? Are you going to start using blockchains? And they were like, who are you? <laughs> and so after a couple of years, I decided like, my obsession as it basically became with crypto needed to become my job. So I left and joined the you know, crypto industry full time back in, uh, I think it was 2018 and have, yeah, have been in the space ever since working for various startups. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I, I like that you call it beautifully simple. And I just, <laughs> before the interview, I'm saying some of this stuff's a little bit over my head, but if it's beautifully simple for you, I well, some of that. it, not all of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so yeah, what I, I thought would be a good way to go about this, because I know as, you know, as Litecoiners, we're all very excited about it. We hear kind of the general rough idea of what's going to happen. Um, and I'm kind of hoping to take it and, you know, give it some context. I, I like even the idea of some imagery or some stories around, you know, how, how these things are going to work. And you have to ignore if my dog is barking up there, but um i can't shut her up so um i thought like real quick let's do a brief and i might even share my screen real quick because in your article you go through like what's a regular transaction act like today and i did this I, we had a podcast our second episode we had david burkett uh actually go through pretty length a pretty lengthy time on this that helped me understand it and in your article you kind of explain here's how a regular transaction works so i'm going to pull up if i can I'm going to do a screen share, hopefully, here. Hold on. <laughs> Let's see if this works. Um, yes, here's me. Oh, this is going to be some sort of like, yeah. I know oh, one of those Inception. Things. Yeah, <laughs> Inception. So can you see that okay? Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Okay, I don't know why I can't also, but okay. Uh, I mean, I can see it, but I can't see you anymore. So, um, yeah, kind of walk us through. Here's a Litecoin transaction. I just pulled it up from like a very recent block. And, um, you know, what I think is important for people to understand is like this first, uh, 
this is your input, right? What we, is that what we call this? Is that the basic yeah. term for this? An yeah. input. And when you input a transaction, you have to use the entirety of one specific address. You can't just send a partial of an address. So it, I, you know, it's been equated to being using bills before, which I think is a really good thing, like a $5 bill. You can't spend 4.2 out of your $5 bill. So when there's $4.20 due at the register, you give them the whole $5 bill. So just like here, someone had to give over their entire 17.2 whatever. Um, and then on the other side of this is, okay, are, are these both called UTXOs? So UTXO stands for unspent transaction output. And okay. um, so that's basically the uh, the bills that you have or the coins, uh, which are part of bills that you have in your purse or I'm trying not to say wallet because that is a crypto term. But yeah, imagine you're in a store and you have all these kind of coins and notes to use. Then we call those the UTXOs. You then will get a collection of notes or coins, depending how much you want to, to spend. If you're buying a can of Coke or uh, you're doing a kind of full weekly shop and getting all the groceries in, you'll get the amount of bills and, and notes, um, bills and coins that you want and give those to the shopkeeper. They will then give you the change as well as your goods. So we call those the output addresses or the okay. outputs of a transaction and the inputs slightly confusingly, are our unspent transaction outputs because your inputs are always outputs of a previous transaction. Right. So this it seems really in... counterintuitive to yeah. have inputs being called UTXOs with O being outputs. Right. Yeah. Because they're all, <laughs> I guess they're all ultimately unspent, right? They don't get burned or anything. So they just get moved around. So this, this one goes, so let's say this was the shop in that scenario and they took the you, had, you spent a lot of money on groceries today, fourteen hundred dollars, <laughs> and uh, you. This goes to them, and will be considered will be an an address within their wallet, and cool. just and likewise, this will come back to you, and be a new address in your wallet. So the next time you go to spend, you'll have a wallet with this amount in it. Yeah. Okay. And that will then become the input of another transaction. Right. It'll move back over here whenever you choose yeah. to spend it. Okay. And the important thing to, to know about all this, and I think what most of us Litecoiners are so excited about, is that right now all this stuff is here on you know blockchain or whatever whatever platform you want to look at. That um, I mean, how many different block explorers are there? Oh, so or many. inside your own inside a node, you can go look at every transaction that's ever been on any of these coins. So what the issue, um, as we saw recently with uh, the Canadian truckers or um, maybe something going into the Ukraine or money being donated. Maybe maybe you received, maybe a Russian sent, you, sent some coins, you know, two years ago, and one of their UTXOs is now tied to one of your UTXOs, even though you had no uh, transactions or any sort of interaction with that person whatsoever. It might just be way down the line. And the concern is that you don't want blacklisted wallet addresses. So what and Mimble Wimble is trying to do what we'll talk about is to create some fungibility. So let me make sure I'm back on our screen here. Okay, I'll get us off of this uh, awful inception, as you call it. <laughs> All right. So, um, so yeah. So that's how a um, regular transaction works. So what's different about if you're to summarize, and we'll get into the details. If you're to summarize, what's different about a Mimble Wimble transaction than the regular transaction. Yeah, and this is, I suppose, a hard one to summarize just because there's so much tech going on. But essentially, what we've just seen there is a transaction that's happening on the Litecoin blockchain, and we can see all of that address information. We can see the amount information. We could click on any of those addresses and kind of follow its flow through to an, another destination or the source of where it came from. When we're thinking about transactions that happen on uh, Mimblewimble or more specifically within the extension blocks where Mimblewimble will be kind of activated, um, you won't be able to see who is moving money between who and how much. So in many ways, it's very similar to um, if you think of the Lightning Network, which is predominantly known as being on Bitcoin, but there is actually a Lightning Network uh, on the Litecoin Network, which I only discovered the other day. I was like, it was uh, the, fir the first ever transaction. Uh, on Lightning was 
was sent Much to Charlie Lee. That. Did you know that? Oh, love that. I love that Charlie was like, <laughs> so involved in the project still. Um, and when you think of like funds moving on the Lightning Network, you can see when funds are being kind of moved in and locked up on the Lightning, uh, the Litecoin Network or the Bitcoin Network. And then all of those other transactions happen kind of like in the dark or behind a curtain. It's all going on. And you know that it can be verified using mathematics to make sure that nothing untoward is happening about new coins being created, for instance. But you can't actually see the transaction details. There's no block explorer to see Lightning Network transactions. Likewise, if we think of uh, kind of privacy orientated coins like Zcash, for instance, and Monero, they have privacy features which stop you seeing, uh, in Monero's case, anything going on. So you can't see any transaction details, the sender, the recipient, or the amount. And for the Zcash blockchain, they have a special functionality called shielded addresses. And again, when you have transactions between two shielded addresses, you can't see the input addresses, the output addresses, or the amount. So a lot of the kind of functionality or the conception here um, that we have with Mimblewimble is doing basically what other chains do in slightly different ways, which is hiding the uh, sender, the recipient, and the amount. Mimblewimble with extension blocks or MWeb, uh, as it's called, is doing it in a different way to those blockchains. But yeah, fundamentally, it's hiding that information that you can currently see on a block explorer. Yeah, two things on that. Zcash, they should totally change their name to Zcash, not <laughs> Zcash. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cooler. I'm going to say a lot of things in like a British it's, accent, which yeah. might make them sound a bit odd. <laughs> no, it's, but it sounds much cooler, Zcash. Um, well, and I, I think what's interesting, too, about the Lightning Network, because obviously, like you said, Litecoin has a Lightning Network as well. And I think a lot of people who are, I would say, I don't know, there's a lot of skepticism around the Lightning Network, not because it is not able to function or something like that, but it seems to lend itself towards uh, centralized nodes. And, you know, not yet, you know, but it does seem to lean that way. And then you do lose a lot of, yeah, maybe you and I can't see each other's transactions, but somebody can see those transactions. And I think that's where a little bit of the, hesitation so th this almost feels like a lightning network or yeah like a lightning network implementation that's um not administered by anybody it's a centralized node that yeah. is administered by the blockchain in a way which is, which is fair and and without going i suppose on too much of a lightning network tangent there is loads of stuff that is happening um i don't know like i'm more of a um focus kind of more on the Bitcoin uh, side of things rather than Litecoin, don't hate me. Um, but there's a lot of work going on on the Bitcoin Lightning Network, and I right. presume it kind of will filter over um, in terms of privacy. So uh, trampoline nodes, onion routing, like all of this stuff is being kind of developed and experimented to, as you say, try and make sure that there aren't these kind of privacy gaps. But as with right. everything, and, and I suppose we haven't quite said it yet so I'll address it you know I work for a blockchain analytics company so I'm talking right. about privacy here we'll like address the elephant in the room I suppose but privacy you know uh, financial privacy is in my view personally a fundamental human right I totally agree Charlie mm -hmm. Lee said that fairly recently on on an interview and so when we're talking about you know using the lightning network or using member Wimble you know Financial privacy is important. So whatever way it's achieved, it doesn't have to be just the Lightning Network or just Member Wimble or just the privacy coin. The good thing is that there's loads of experimentation happening on all of these different implementations to try and make financial privacy possible. Of course, with all of that, and, and a subtle plug for blockchain analytics, I suppose, here, but is making sure that financial privacy isn't then taken advantage of by bad actors. So, right. you know, that's why there's always a lot of innovation in this space, both on the kind of privacy front, as well as also the protection front uh, with like, for instance, blockchain analytics. Okay. I know many people have different views about uh, blockchain analytics, so. Well, um, I mean, yeah, we, I don't want to go, to, I want to get into the Mimble Wimble, but I will yeah. say <laughs> here's what I, I, I think is important. I think that um, I've always felt like, you know, we live in, in America, I don't know if it's the same in London, but innocent until proven guilty. And I think that the, onus is on yeah the onus is on whoever it is to to prove your guilt and that you can't be guilty until proven innocent they can't have the ability to hold your money until they decide that you've proven yourself innocent and i think that's that's where a lot of people get very uh, who are really thinking about these things uh see where this could go if if we don't have some of these layers of frankly i mean fungibility is the biggest thing privacy is part yeah. of it but fungibility is a, a 
a thing that I have said, it's kind of a boring word. It sounds kind of <laughs> clunky. It doesn't, it doesn't click with you that, that it means, you know, all one or all the same kind of. So it's just kind of an interesting uh, evolution. It's part of the things you learn as you get through this stuff. So, okay, we've gotten through how it works today <laughs> and let's get into a Mimblewimble transaction. Okay. Um, first things first, what is going on now? A peg in, I'm actually, I'm going to do this. I'm going to share a screen again. I'm, I'm going to do it better this time. Okay. Hi. I'm not going to have the uh... <laughs> second time lucky. I'm not going to do the, you can see what, what uh, apps I have on my exciting desktop. Okay. So let me, let me make this a little larger. Oh, come on. Really? <laughs> well, Maybe I, can, I don't know. Is that is that Should large? Be able to no, zoom no, no. In. Like that? Is that better? Is that under like on the kind of the panel where there's like a picture of a rubber and I see like a paintbrush? Is there a little magnifying glass? You should be able to. Oh. Well, this is a. I just pulled this in with. Uh, oh. Yeah, I was using Paint 3D today. What the heck? <laughs> Let's go for it. I was, um, man, I was trying to get this uh, background thing going today. That about made me nuts. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. It was ridiculous. Okay. Can you see it all right? Yeah. Whoa. Too big. Perfect. No, I'm going to do this. I'm doing this. We're doing this. Better. Okay. Hi. Right, nice. So, yeah. So yeah, walk me through what's what's the the first thing here is this peg in transaction, right? So this is going yeah. all happening. This all kind of happens simultaneously, right? All these things are going to happen when the block is mined. Yeah. So I think first of all, before we go into like the pegging in and pegging out transactions, it makes sense first to just like take a couple of seconds to talk about extension blocks and what they are because the activity that's happening here relates very directly to extension blocks. So if we okay. take a step back just a couple of quick seconds. So the way that Mimblewimble is being implemented in Litecoin is pretty different how it's being implemented in Grin and Beam, for instance, which are previous implementations that people might have heard of. So okay. the way that we're doing it in Litecoin is having these things called extension blocks, which you can essentially think of as like a parallel highway. So you have the Litecoin blockchain, which is running new block every roughly two and a half uh, minutes. Although when I looked at um, a block explorer, couple of hours ago we'd had uh, over 10 minutes since a previous block i was like oh things are you know you know it's something a I, bit slow i just recently discovered that like i wasn't looking at the mempool the bitcoin mempool and i was like it was taking like an hour and a half for a block to come and i'm like why is this happening i thought is this broken but that just happens sometimes there's difficulty in uh whatever no one solves the yeah whatever, finds adjust. the number or whatever yeah. The, the beauty of a difficulty epoch, it will adjust. But yeah, yeah it will adjust. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, basically, you have on the, the Lightning, uh, the Litecoin network, every roughly two and a half minutes with variability, we'll have a new block. In our extension block kind of network or pseudo network, we'll have a new extension block every two and a half minutes. So, they kind of move at the same pace together. And what we're doing uh, when we talk about transactions kind of moving between blocks as a super high level, and then we'll go into the details, you're basically topping up a pool of funds from the main Litecoin blockchain. We then move those funds over to the extension block. So if you've got kind of 10 Litecoin uh, that we put in this pool, we then make 10 Litecoin available within our extension blocks. People can do all sorts of uh, Mimblewimble related activity for those 10 Litecoin. And then when they want to move it back into the Litecoin world, we have what, these things called pegging out transactions. So we kind of move the funds from the extension blocks back onto the main chain. So kind of think about it as like you take your Litecoin, you can use it on the main Litecoin network, or you can kind of like port it over to the extension blocks and do a load of activity there. So we have our funds that can kind of move in and out and between, and we call these pegging in and pegging out transactions. And we're gonna talk uh, through those in a little bit. And then these mysterious things called an integration transaction, which kind of does the processing of them. But fundamentally, you're just kind of 
moving some coins from the main blockchain over to our extension blocks to do a load of activity there. And then in order to make sure that these two uh, kind of parallel chains are connected, we have our miners on the main chain, which are securing the activity that's happening over on our extension blocks uh, by kind of creating like these summary transactions of activity. Would so you, can, I, can I stop yeah. you? Like, cause we're, we were talking earlier because this, there's a lot of imagery from Harry Potter and they talk yeah. about <laughs> Hog X, Hogwarts Express. Uh, would you say that maybe a good analogy would be train cars and that they are, they're linked, right? So you'd have your, maybe your lead train car would be your main chain. And then you might have the caboose, let's call it, is, <laughs> is going to be Mimble Wimble and that people can move in between these two, but they're all moving together. Yeah. Or maybe they... And like every time they stop at a new rail station, that's when that's like the two and a half minutes where everything gets validated and then we move on. Yeah, I think maybe about like, it's almost like having two railway tracks next to each other. Next to each other. And on okay. one, you've got like your normal train, which has just like your normal people on it, doing normal transactions, like <laughs> buying a cup of coffee. And then on the other rail, which runs exactly the same time, you've got a load of like witches and wizards, and they're all conducting transactions <laughs> and no one can see because they're witches and wizards. But every time the train stops, like you say, at a station, both trains have to stop at a station because yeah. they're kind of like to like parallel trains together so yeah we have our normal litecoin blockchain which like you or i could be on and, and do whatever we want and then we have this like secret hogwarts express running next well, to us where you can clear. only be on if you're like hermione and harry yeah you can use mimble wimble if you're not a witch let's be clear about that well you can you can <laughs> you have to like temporarily like become a witch so you've got to put your, <laughs> yeah, like, okay. your witches or your wizard's hat on uh, and kind of transact <laughs> over there and i suppose that reflects like and, you know, maybe we'll go into more detail in a minute, but, you know, there is a level of interactivity that Mimble Wimble provides. So I think there's going to be quite a lot of tooling which has to happen within the wider ecosystem to help mm -hmm. people, you know, become the wizard and, and witches and do these Mimble Wimble transactions. So, yeah. yeah, well, you know, and maybe if someone's listening that's going to create this, you know, feel free to use more Harry Potter analogies. It goes down very well in the space uh, with regarding this. There's, yeah, a whole history of like Harry Potter characters reviewing the code and all sorts. It's like this. I, I love it. That's one of the things I think is great about kind of blockchain and, and the cryptocurrency industry. Like we're changing the world, but we're also having a bit of fun with it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. OK, so I am keep interrupting you. Sorry. So we have the two okay. trains running against each other. And then when I'm on the normal person train yeah. and I decide I want to go at the next block, the next stop, I want to get out and move some of my coins over to the Her the Hogwarts Express. What, how how does that go down? What happens? Here? Yeah, so this is called a pegging in transaction. So basically, you've got to send some Litecoin to this special address, uh, which is uh, going to be prefixed or will literally now be prefixed with LTC1. So that's like a special address type, uh, which isn't shows LTC, that you're... Isn't LTC MWeb1? Um, oh, I think it's LTC1 because it's taproot enabled. There's LTC MWeb, which is a special, so that's for our Hogwarts transactions. It might okay, be LTC okay. MWeb one, but I think from, um, I mean, I asked Charlie Lee this in a post a while ago. So uh, when I asked that, it was LTC one, okay, but there was okay. a chance that it could be I've LTC seen them both. MWeb just didn't one. Know. All right, go ahead. Yeah. I'll take your some kind of that. variation there of that. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Hopefully, someone can confirm in like the comments or something, or uh, Charlie and Dave can like jump in <laughs> and correct. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. Um, I also, like, I want to definitely kind of preface. Like, I'm no expert on Mimble Wimble. I've read the the Litecoin and Premium proposals and um, kind of obsessively watched and read a load of stuff, but um, there will be bits I don't know about this for sure. So okay. um, for our pegging in transaction, so you users send uh, a load of Litecoin to this special address. That includes a commitment to a certain uh, extension block. So basically you're saying the next block that's going to happen, this is where I want to basically like kind of put my coins in. So you'll think of it almost as like, almost don't want to use the word, but like depositing coins into the next extension block. So that's what our um, pegging and transaction is. And we can all do pegging and transactions. So every user that wants to kind of use some Litecoin within either the next or uh, subsequent uh, extension blocks, we kind of create these transactions. So in this uh, image here, where we see pegging in transaction and then brackets S, that's just demonstrating mm -hmm. one Litecoin transaction. So one pegging in transaction. If 10 of us, for instance, were creating 10 pegging in transactions, then we would see kind of 10 versions of that little tree with one Litecoin 
input or brackets inputs because you can have multiple inputs within a Litecoin transaction because it's mm -hmm. a UTXO model. And then that uh, A, which is our, called a kernel commitment, uh, kernels are ish complicated maths basically. So it's best to think <laughs> of it as just like the special address uh, that we're filling up with uh, some Litecoin. We can have some standard LTC output. So like our change address that we mentioned before, like if you're shopping in a grocery store and you get some change back to yourselves. So if you and I were both doing a pegging in transaction, there would be my inputs going to my outputs um, and one of these special LTC ad LTC one addresses. And then you would have a separate like mini tree from your inputs going into a special LTC address, which is including that commitment. So we can have 10 of those in there. Whereas in this graph, uh, in this diagram rather, for simplicity, <laughs> there's basically just one pegging in transaction, but we would have as many as people are basically like depositing funds into the extension block. Okay. All right. So then there's uh we have, okay. So, so you can add, you can add in, let's, let's just say there's the, both of us put, both put in 10 Litecoin. Yeah. And we're both going to have one of these in the Now, does this all happen in the same block? Right. So these yeah, kind of right. sit in the mempool. These sit in the mempool, which yeah. we'll call like the platform, the waiting, the loading dock. <laughs> yeah, I love that. For the, yeah. for the train. And once the train comes to our stop, we get on and should we go into this? Yeah, so exactly. Yeah, okay. we're going to the extension one. So in um, this diagram, what you can see is we've got the LTC header, which is the header of our block. We've got um, the Merkle tree. And so the Merkle tree might be something people are familiar with as a term, but just to kind of simplify it. So um, you might often see this within Block Explorers called the Merkle root. And basically what it is, is a summary of all the transactions in the block. So in the kind of old but current world, where we have transactions only on the main Litecoin chain, the Merkle root, uh, the maths of it is basically think of like you take all the transactions, you kind of times them together uh, in a what we call a tree structure until you just have one value at the top, which represents all the transactions in that block. So it means okay. that if anyone then tries to like change any transactions, I pretend, oh my God, what did I do? I shouldn't have sent you a thousand Litecoin the other day. If I then go and try and change that transaction in the block, the Merkle root will be different because the Merkle root is made up of all those transactions like an aggregate. So at the moment, our Merkle root for a Litecoin block is only looking at transactions of Litecoin on the uh, canonical, I don't actually know how you say the word. Can canonical, non probably. Canonical. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I've never said that word out loud if I've ever read it. So <laughs> That's um, how I say it in my head, so yeah. I'll just go with that. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> it's like trying to pr uh, pronounce like Andrew Palestra's name for ages. I was like, I don't know how you say this out loud. I hope someone one day says it on a video. And I'll know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we have all these transactions that are just main Litecoin chain transactions. We kind of like times together to have a single value, and we call that our Merkle root. Whereas in the new world, when we've got Mimble Wimble with extension blocks, we'll have those main chain transactions, but we will also have all these pegging in transactions and the integration transactions. So within a single block on the Litecoin network, we'll have our main chain transactions as well as all the linked transactions that are happening on MWeb. So as a miner on the main blockchain, you'll be securing with your hash rate, both the transactions on the main chain, as well as MWeb transactions. So that's where we get the kind of security of MWeb comes from like the foundational security of Litecoin, because our miners are also mining transactions that have happened or a summary of transactions that have happened over on the extension blocks. And we call all of those transactions now together, our kind of main chain transactions, as well as our extension block transactions. All of those will make up the Merkle root within that single block. Okay. That's confusing. <laughs> yeah. It just means like before a block was only main Litecoin transactions, and okay. now a single block will be Litecoin transactions and a summary of all the activity that's happening over on MWeb as well. But there's something going on with the the like you said, the very complicated maths that's that yeah. allows that to be obscured to the public, but still ensures that those values are validated and that no additional or, um, you know, no more or less coins are moving on than should. And what yeah. I think what was interesting to me, uh, maybe before we get into this, what I thought I didn't really know about was this. Uh, what part is it? This previous, yeah, oh, where, yeah, where basically each block, there's one bulk transaction that moves all the coins that were in MWeb, the previous block, yeah. into the new block. 
Yes. So you can think of it like, um, let's say I have a I have a piggy bank and you know, I've got some amount of money and um, I can't, and then the piggy bank doesn't have like a little hole in the bottom that I can just kind of shake the, the coins out. So instead I have to kind of like smash the piggy bank up. I've got all my coins. I can like count it all up, but now I need a brand new piggy bank that I've got to put all the coins back in. So every time we have an extension block, we've got to move all of our coins from that extension block into a brand new extension block and top up with any new coins that are coming in from the pegging in transactions. So if I had 20 Litecoin in my previous piggy bank slash extension block, then I can like smash that open. I move them all into the next piggy bank extension block and top up with, in this case, we've got two uh, pegging in transactions, 10 from me, mm -hmm. 10 from you. So I put those 20 in as well. So you move over and then top up with the pegging in transactions. Okay, so that happens second. And so is this chronological? We have here this previous address. We top up and then new hog address. Right. <laughs> yeah, the terminology is confusing. So let me try and simplify a bit. So <laughs> all of this is happening. Uh, the kind of bad answer is all of this happens at the same time because it's all within the right. same block. Um, right. But order is really, really important. So uh, when we're creating our integration transaction or our Hogwarts uh, Express transaction, you need a bit of Harry Potter magic. So uh, the first thing that you're going to do, the first input you're going to take is moving the coins from the previous extension block into the new extension block. So that mm -hmm. has to happen first. That's really important. So our first input within the transaction is we move the funds from the previous extension block into this extension block. So kind of move them across. If we had 40 in the last extension block, we move them over and we've got 40 now as our minimum in this one. Now the next inputs we have and we'll have X number of inputs, depending how many pegging in transactions we have. So in this case, we'll have two in our example. And mm -hmm. what we're going to do for those uh, pegging in transactions, then we're going to basically create um, two what we call coin based transactions, which move funds from the main chain over into our new hog address. So that's the uh, little yellow box for this um, extension block. So let's break that down because I've said a bunch of words there. So a coin based transaction is not anything to do with the exchange. Uh, Coinbase transactions <laughs> are where we create new cryptocurrency. So uh, for Bitcoin and Litecoin, we have one uh, Coinbase transaction per block on the main chain because with every new block, we create some new Bitcoin or Litecoin, uh, depending what our, our kind of creation schedule is. So for Bitcoin, it's 6.25 new Bitcoins every block. Um, I actually don't know what it is for Litecoin right now. Well, I don't follow that closely. So uh, you know. Litecoin right, well, Litecoin right now is six. Or it's 12 and a half, I'm sorry. 12 and a half, okay. Yeah. So with every new block, we'll get 12 and a half Litecoin that are created. And that's that doesn't change with Mimble Wimble extension blocks. That stays the same. But what we've got to do, because we've got this new parallel highway, is we've got to create, for example, two Coinbase transactions that are essentially kind of moving funds from the main Litecoin network over into our extension block. So we call those still Coinbase transactions because we're creating some new Litecoin over in our extension block. So we'll have our first input, which is moving the funds from the previous extension block. And then we're going to top up our extension block with these two uh, transactions from our pegging in transactions. So 10 from you, 10 from me. So we'll create 20 new Litecoin into this hog address. So for our new extension block, we've basically brought over the 40 Litecoin from before. We've added the 20 Litecoin from our two pegging in transactions. So we can think of this as kind of moving the previous balance and topping it up with any peg in transactions. So that's the input side of things okay. <laughs> that we're doing. So making sure that we've got uh, the balance across and topping it up. We then have outputs, so all transactions have uh, inputs and outputs, except from asterisk there, except from coin-based transactions on the main chain. <laughs> they don't have inputs because obviously they're creating coins out of thin air. Um, and just like uh, our inputs, we'll have the first output, and this is where it gets a little bit confusing because everything happens at once. The first output is paying out to the next extension block, whatever the kind of balance is of the current block. So if we think of our first input uh, from that was topping up from the previous extension block, it's kind of the mirror of that. So we're topping up, bringing that 40 across into our block, but that has to have come from the previous block. So just like I said before, of every input being uh, an output for every output, sorry, being an input for something else, we take over the balance of 40 from the previous block, but we've got to account for moving 
whatever the remaining balance of the block is into that kind of n plus one block. So our first output always creates a payout to the next block. So it says if we're left with 30 Litecoin after we've done our pegging out transactions, and we'll talk about those in a second, then make sure that once this block is kind of done, we move those over to our next block. So it's just kind of like passing the funds from one block to the next block to the next block. So our first output always does that kind of passing over and says, right, move whatever's left, our balance of uh, Litecoin in the extension block, move that to the next block. So that's how is that, is that a kind of a security thing to ensure that they don't get somehow sent somewhere else or yeah, it's like first things first, make sure no matter what you can't, can't send these anywhere. These can't be destroyed. They're already committed in a way. Yeah. I think it's just to make sure that, cause you have basically X plus one inputs and Y plus one outputs where X is the number of pegging in transactions and Y is the number of pegging out transactions. And that extra one on the inputs and outputs is kind of move Litecoins in uh, from the previous extension block and then send Litecoins out. So being kind of first of the inputs and first of the outputs, I suppose, mirrors the fact that that is, gotcha. you know, whether there's going to be any transactions at all, because, hey, maybe there'll be a block where there's either no pegging in transactions or no pegging out transactions. The first thing is just moving the funds across and kind of, okay. yeah, I suppose, chaining them between different extension blocks. And so those essentially, that's a, so is that is that's an on that will be a visible transaction. Yeah. It, so like MWeb will have its own unique Litecoin address. Yeah. So this is um and maybe this is like a privacy element that people don't uh yet kind of fully grasped all of these pegging in transactions are on chain so you'll be mm -hmm. able to see someone's pegging in twenty uh, Litecoin for instance onto in you know block one let's say just for easy yeah. numbers and then you'll be able to see that people are trying to move out seven Litecoin from uh, this block four, let's say. So all of this has on-chain activity, which can be largely traced. Uh, the integration transaction is also happening in the main chain as well. So you'll be able to kind of essentially see the like balance, I suppose, as it were, that is living on the extension blockchain. Now you won't, and this is where we get our privacy from, you won't be able to see what's happening in each extension block. So it's kind of similar, I suppose, to um, like the Zcash blockchain. You can see when someone is, if someone uses a shielded address, so you have two addresses, shielded and transparent. If someone uses a transparent address to pay a shielded address, you can see how much money has moved across, like 20 Zec, let's say. What that shielded address does next, you can't see because that's doing shielded activity. So the Mimblewimble kind of protocol upgrade to Litecoin is not bringing like complete privacy to the chain in mm -hmm. any way at all. Um, and I think Dave addressed this in um, a thread that I was reading on like the Litecoin forum, where he said like there's still quite a lot of additional privacy features that we could look to bring to MWeb in the future, like doing much more on this like on-chain privacy side, like maybe adding, I don't know, like we could add more coin join or confidential transactions on like the main Litecoin chain, because right now you do lose a lot of privacy. Like people know you're going into MWeb, they just, or the extension block specifically, they just don't know what you're doing once you're in the extension blocks so you have that kind of privacy leakage there yes. okay. just like well, people know when you're going into like the shielded pool on zcash they just don't know what you're doing in that shield they, they see you walk through platform nine and three quarters yeah i love that yeah right? yeah <laughs> and they see yeah. you come out yeah but well, they so, don't well, know here... what you did on the train right <laughs> what happens <laughs> at hogwarts stays at hogwarts. <laughs> yeah, <I love> that. <laughs> no so uh well, okay this is this is interesting to me because this is something that i i had written down we might be jumping ahead so when I peg out, like it's obvious. So let's let's just paint a scenario where I I take my coins off Coinbase for the the exchange. I'll say Binance that way it's, yeah. it makes it easy. Oh yeah, yeah. Not to make it confusing. <laughs> and I give them, you know, my I give them my wallet, my ID. I know who I am, and so they, I send it to address one two three four five. They go, yep. By the way, my I, you know I never introduced myself. My name's Grant, by the way. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh yep, those are Grant's coins. Um, and I see now he just took those and put them onto Mimblewimble. Yeah. Is there any correlation to the peg out coins? For, like, was there any connection at all or any way to tie those together? I know there's some, um, ad, David talked about some address linkability and like combined batching uh, multiple UTXOs together and being, if you're doing some chain analysis, it might be something that could be done. 
But like on the surface, if you're in there for a while, you make a bunch of transactions, you put six in and you take 3.27 out. Like, is there any way they would really know anybody would be able to decipher that? So when you, um, it's a really good question. So when you peg out, you have to specify the Litecoin address you want uh, the funds to be sent to. Mm -hmm. And what what you've also got to provide um, is something basically called a kernel, which links um, your kind of initial input with where you want to send it. Like I can't just come in and be like, I want to take 400 Litecoin out of uh, the extension block. I want to be like, well, did you put 400 in? Like what's the situation here? So um, there is that linking obviously from a maps level. And if you reuse your address, uh, which obviously you should never do address reusage uh, is really poor from like a privacy leakage perspective. But if you did or you used um, or you then like uh, reused the output uh, or the input uh, that within another transaction, then exactly as you say, you could link it. So uh, it's all about, you know, making sure that you're using new addresses to peg out to. Uh, you can then obviously make sure that you don't respend that. Uh, so we have a, a phrase called common spend, which is where um, when you have multiple inputs for a transaction, they're clustered to, or you can cluster them together because if you have the private key for one, you have the private key for all. Therefore, you own them all. Uh, an exception being coin join transactions, which are actually taking multiple different people's inputs um, together and then processing lots of other uh, lots of little transactions as a result of that. But largely, yeah, if you're going to come and spend your um, kind of post MWeb transactions with your pre mweb transactions are totally separate then they can be clustered together in terms okay. of the on-chain information for the, the pegging out transaction it's just that litecoin address um and then i'm not 100 percent sure actually what exactly is within the kernel uh but the kernel kind of from a a maths level, I suppose, is basically like a multi-sig key for all the input owners and the output owners to ensure like authentication. And then you use it also as proof that uh, the inputs and outputs add up to zero. So no new money has been created. So because it's that kind of the multi-sig element, then I suppose that would have no, mm, yeah, I don't think really that would have the privacy leakage other than like a group level. So I don't, yeah, I, don't, I think it's minimal leakage from that regard it's more the post spending on where you could potentially like link it to other um litecoin activity but yeah i mean i could be wrong there you use it just put everything in there (laughs) let's stay for a while and then bring everything out and then never use any main chain coins ever again you'll be fine uh, yeah i mean (laughs) you know that's largely the the challenge with um kind of privacy at large on chain is is people mix their inputs together with other inputs and they can be clustered together because as we said I suppose the top of the call like all these UTXOs those like addresses with small bits of Litecoin in because um, they act as like bills and you're constantly like kind of like spending the whole amount creating some change you can have a wallet with hundreds if not thousands of these like small bits of litecoin Uh, we sometimes refer to this as dust on the network so really Mm -hmm. small amounts uh, of litecoin and when you kind of group them up together to spend them or uh, use some of them with other ones you're revealing a lot of information about your kind of who you are on chain Uh, you know that's one of the reasons that we have Mm. improvements like this for instance to try and give you alternative um parts of the blockchain to operate and if you want have uh, if you want to have more financial privacy interesting yeah that's that's like a whole nother discussion to have because that is yeah. something that, he br- that david brought up in the interview that we did was the address linkability um and i think the more you know I, again the privacy factor i think you know you have your advocates um you know if we talk about the monero folks or the zcash people and um if it's not absolute 100 percent. and look cake wallet they're part of the show they've been on here they're monero people and they'll say well and you know it's not perfect therefore you know <laughs> what's the point if it's not all the time um i know it's an improvement i know that they all feel it's a very big improvement and that's why i think more than anything i've tried to focus more on the fungibility aspect of it and that the more people that are in and out of um mimble wimble the the more it becomes just a big mess of mweb coins non mweb coins and and going on to mweb isn't a crime i think that's the thing to remember right it's not like you did anything wrong just just to exercise just using a coin yeah and that's 
yeah that's like the same with uh zcash as well like so um if you look at the amount of shield and activity that ha that happens on zcash so it's up to a, when i last looked about 17 percent which is still you know pretty low um but mm -hmm. just because you're using a shielded output does not mean you're a criminal at all you know there's right. so many great use cases or needed use cases for privacy like if you live in a authoritarian government which has really strict capital controls if you're living in a country where your financial freedom has been curtailed because of you know maybe you're you're in afghanistan for instance and you've got the taliban keeping control of your finances well you know being able to use a you know, privacy orientated cryptocurrency can be potentially life saving. Or hey, you just want to donate to a political party and you don't want the whole world seeing. Like there's mm -hmm. so many reasons you'd want to use privacy. And so I think what's going to be really interesting here is um, often with many new innovations, we do see illicit actors start using it first. So with MWeb or even uh, other privacy orientated uh, or privacy kind of uh, plus uh, type innovations, it's going to be really interesting to see like who starts using it. Is it you know, do we start seeing loads of illicit funds piling in and they're trying to use it like a mixer? Do we see a lot of just interested people that want to trial it out? Do we see a lot of people from countries or uh, use cases where they need that financial privacy? And until it goes live, right. we, we, we just won't know what we'll see. But, you know, I want to stress that like, just because some bad actors might start to use extension blocks does not mean that we should see all activity going into uh, Mimblewimble extension blocks as somehow kind of like tainted. You can be a good person that just so happens to have your money mixed up with bad actors. And that doesn't mean you're bad just by association. Yeah, yeah I, I, I thought of this the other day because it's so, it's so common. People will say, well, if you got nothing to hide, right? It's like, well, OK, you don't put you don't put cameras in the bathrooms. Why not? Yeah. Right. There's, <laughs> there's a certain example. level, yeah. there's a certain level of privacy you expect. And certainly there's, you know, I think there's always trade-offs. I think to be, you know, it's like a cost trade-off. You can't be private all the time. I mean, some people are, but it's a very, it's a big endeavor. And so people yeah. aren't willing to take those steps. And so what I love, what I've loved about this uh, opt-in nature of it that Charlie created and, and David, don't tell <laughs> me pass him up, was that it's it, they, the whole point is to make it as easy as possible to access. Yeah. And um, that's something. And again, I talk about these every week, so I'm probably reiterating to people who listen to me regularly. But, you know, the the ability, one thing that's important for people to know is that they can take a normal, we'll call it an on-chain LTC <laughs> and just send it to an LTC MWeb address. And when they do that, uh, my understanding, you tell me I'm wrong, their wallet does this without them really even knowing it, right? Yeah. And sends it to the other users, the recipient who requested an MWeb coin. Um, it sends it to their MWeb address and now it's in MWeb. Oh, this is interesting ish, now. Ish. Yeah, so the pegging in transaction is you as a user kind of, entering the extension block world. Once you want to do transactions within the Mimblewimble world, so within each extension block. So let's say um, I've put a load of uh, funds into an extension block. So I've kind of got this like balance, let's say of 10 Litecoin to play with. If I then want to send you a transaction which has the, the Mimblewimble privacy preserving um, kind of functionality to it, we would then have to create a member Wimble transaction. So this is an interactive process. And this is why I say that I think there's going to have to be some better tooling in the space where you and I basically jointly come together to create the transaction. Now there aren't, and this is what kind of throws people off as well, there aren't addresses within the Mimble Wimble world. Madness, I know. So I wouldn't be able to say to you, here's my Mimble Wimble address, send me some Mimble Wimbled uh, Litecoin. Instead, you and I get together, we create a transaction using um, signatures and that is how we move coins within the mimble wimble world so this is why i say there's going to have to be tooling for this mm -hmm. because it's it does not um come naturally it doesn't follow the traditional kind of routes that people will be familiar with of hey here's my litecoin address send me some litecoin instead we come together to do this interactive process where i'm going to move say 10 uh, litecoin to you using mimble wimble we do all sorts of well, not we, but the, the Mimble Wimble protocol does all sorts of cool, exciting math, uh, like birds and commitments um, to make sure that uh, 
you know, you're sending me a certain amount, but we don't reveal that to the rest of the world, whether it's the Mimblewimble extension block world or even more broadly. So just wanting to send me some uh, Mimblewimble Litecoin, you know, that intention is great, but actually there's a load of maths that we have to do to make that happen. I I think I had a totally different uh, understanding of this from from David. Um, So you will have, my understanding are stealth addresses. And you can send coins from the main chain to MWeb and from MWeb to main chain without um, really any additional burden on the sender. So I, I as an MWeb, if I have an MWeb wallet, <laughs> I can request coins to go into Mimblewimble and they'll go. They'll they like somebody again. They have to be using Litecoin Core Wallet for now, yeah. right? But that they can just send to that straight out of their Core Wallet as long as it's you know at the proper version, of the updated version of Litecoin Core. But there's no, they don't have to actively do anything. They just send it to the address, and the software will make it happen. Okay, but well, yeah, I, I, mean, <laughs> I said like. Mm, like maybe my understanding is 100 percent here but from reading the lips my understanding is you've got to create that pegging in transaction to basically give you a like a balance to play with on uh, within an extension block so kind of well exactly like in the lightning world where if you want to play within lightning and create channels and send payments you've got to kind of fund a balance to then play with yeah well i i hear what you're saying because one thing that this this will be something like I said. Once this is up and running, we might do this again. And I talked to David, and he might be. Yeah, I got David. He obviously knows again. way more than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, because lightning, like you have to enter a balance, and then you work with that balance, and it's all back and forth. Where, um, but like what you were saying, where if I if I'm sending, like if I took my scenario, and let's say it's one coin from Core onto MWeb, um, I would have a balance on MWeb. Well, let's take that scenario. So. If I put a one in there and I send it within MWeb and now my balance on my MWeb side is zero, can I zero that? Like, do I just close that account, close that channel, so to speak? So when you want to, so again, similar to uh, Lightning, you can kind of do whatever you want within uh, the Lightning channel or the Lightning world. But when you want to confirm it or close it whatever kind of terminology we want to use then you have to do something on the main chain so Mm -hmm. and that's why we have these pegging out transactions so in the case that you started with like one ten a thousand then you kind of spend it all within um, an extension block you wouldn't need to create a pegging out transaction of zero because like you you can't pay that litecoin anywhere if you then try and send uh, create a pegging out transaction of say like 10 that's going to be incompatible with all the activity within the extension block you won't have anything to refer to balance wise so it's only when if you just for like easy numbers let's say you have this balance of 10 that you've pegged in you've spent say six sending it to various different people and then you create a pegging out transaction of four going into a like standard uh, main chain lightning address uh, like coin address rather so that then gives you this balance of four you can play with on the main chain it represents the fact that you've done a bunch of transactions in the extension block and whether that's one transaction or 100 transactions nobody knows that's where the privacy element comes from whether Mm -hmm. it was with 10 different addresses or 10 different people again like nobody knows that's the beauty of member Wimble that you can do all this activity and then it's only the summary information that goes back to the main chain. And that summary information right. is your kind of initial balance going on and your kind of final balance going off. But of course, what you can do is you can do a load of activity, take your four Litecoin off, and then maybe in the next block, you want to then actually refund, like refund rather than refund, uh, or refill <laughs> your balance back yeah. into doing a load of Mimblewimble transactions. So then you can do another pegging in transaction and then do a load of other uh, Mimblewimble transactions. What you can't do, um, which maybe is a, a useful point to say, is you can't um, do a withdrawal, so a pegging out transaction back into 
um, an extension block. So when you like withdraw funds from the extension block or you peg out, it has to go to like a standard Litecoin address. Right. You would then within the next block, you create a transaction to kind of refund um, or peg in to re- then use again. Okay. All right. We've talked a lot about the ins and outs. <laughs> Probably too much. Uh, well, what? Okay, so inside, and I do have another screenshot. Let me see if I can pull this up. Now, David kind of made a makeshift thing. Well, I'm not going to bother with it. But essentially, he was showing that in a transaction that within the extension blocks, there's essentially no information shared. So, um, if I send from my M M Web wallet to your M Web wallet, um, there's no sender there's no receiver and there's no coin amount communicated outside of you and me yeah and also you can't go back and look like one of the things that we talk about is you can't go look at my wallet like right now um i could pull up that transaction and i could click on the wallet of the guy who sent it and i could see how many coins does he have yeah like you could see he had 17 and he sent 15 so if he had had 500 in that address we would have seen he had 500 coins and even seeing probably how many inputs, how consistently he was receiving into that wallet, um, as well as, or into that address, I'm sorry. Yeah. And then um, the chain analysis people can figure out wallets and all that. Like you said, this linkability stuff, they can figure out pretty much your whole online profile. Yeah. Oh, no. Um, yes. Although, kind of caveat on that, I suppose, is um, I can say that working for a blockchain analytics firm, we're not interested in the everyday user. We're looking for criminals and we're looking for entities. So yes, like absolutely, you're right. On-chain analytics can be used to track or like could theoretically be used to track anyone's. I can only speak for Elliptic on this one, but we are not interested in looking at Grant's activity or Tara's activity. If you're a terrorist, we will absolutely watch what you're doing and try and make sure you can't spend your Litecoins. If you're like Coinbase and as an exchange, we're keeping uh, track for you on on kind of who uh, if you've got any like criminal activity that's happening there. But we're like we're not just there with our like magnifying glasses, like looking at every transaction and trying to break everyone's privacy. Although, right. as you say, it is all on chain, so you know anyone could try and do that um, if they like felt they needed or wanted to. But certainly, as a blockchain analytics firm, we're looking for the bad actors. And hey, we're you know, you know, we're all conspiracy theorists. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, no matter who gets labeled anyway, Paris, but yeah. right? <laughs> 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 who makes the labels? Who makes the rules? That's ultimately the thing I worry about. But um, okay, uh, I'm going to read. I got a couple other questions. I thought are things maybe just observations. We're just on um, just on oh, your sorry. point there about like the the mimble wimble transactions because I think and you and you just because you mentioned a really interesting point there about like what can you see so a mim a wim, a mil, is such a, well it's literally the tongue tying spell M-Web. and I just like tripped M-Web. over so mweb transactions are made up of like a, a normal transaction they're made up of inputs outputs and these things called kernels but they're not made up of addresses so that's what makes it as you just said like kind of protects it from being able to look at someone's like balance or track back through. So when you create this transaction, you're using the signature. So my signature and your signature to prove that uh, we have the kind of authority to spend the input. So the uh, MWeb Litecoins and send them somewhere else, the outputs. We're making sure that using a bunch of maps, we're not creating any new Litecoin as part of this transaction. And we use something called range proofs, which is just to run as a fancy way of making sure that we're not just um, suddenly spending more than all 84 million Litecoins that we could have um, or using like negative values or doing anything crazy like that. But the maths uh, allows us to create this transaction that doesn't have addresses, but still make sure everything's valid. And so when you have this uh, Mimble Wimble extension block, we have a load of UTXOs, so bits of Litecoin within it, but we have the ability to verify that without having any addresses because it's the addresses that allow you on chain, on the main chain, to be able to kind of link uh, people's transactions or entities transactions together so that's like the fundamental difference within the mweb world we don't have these things called addresses at all we just have a load of maps that's verifying stuff and that's what means that you couldn't just kind of put this on a block explorer and see everything happening together and kind of webbed together okay yeah it's a a, let me uh opinion question for you yeah do you think bitcoin will ever go for this uh really good question um 
I love this question. So I don't think Bitcoin will only because Bitcoin seems to be taking a really different um, approach to privacy. So Bitcoin's had Taproot for a while, which is the other thing uh, that's uh, the other part of this uh, big upgrade uh, with version 21.2 coming out. Um, and so Taproot is kind of uh, privacy via similarity. So it's making sure that if you're creating a transaction that has lots of scripting conditions, you're not saying, hey, I'm creating this transaction with loads of scripting conditions. And then if you have some kind of malicious actor who wants to censor, they can be like, oh, that's using lots of scripting conditions, block. Instead, Taproot makes all transactions, whether simple or with scripting conditions look the same. So that kind of similarity aspect. And so I think actually what Bitcoin's doing is it's kind of uh, moving down a privacy way of just making all transactions look the same. So you have privacy by similarity by a, rather than obscurity. And We've already got, you know, the Lightning Network, which is you know, not super duper active, but there's loads of like really interesting developments happening there. So mm -hmm. I think Bitcoin's just going down that route, um, whether, you know, we have more kind of confidential transactions or bulletproofs come on stream. Um, I think there's a lot of like that individual transaction layer privacy, like coin joins at a bigger level with join market, something like that, rather than creating this parallel highway. Although, you know, who knows, maybe once all the, the covenant drama is sorted on Bitcoin Core, maybe they'll start looking at, at MWeb. But I haven't seen any proposals for it on like the Bitcoin Core dev mailing list or anything like that. So maybe we'll have to see how it goes on Litecoin. And, and if it is really successful, then maybe Bitcoin will look to pick it up. I mean, I got, I mean if you got a few more minutes, I'd, I'm curious what your thoughts are. Because I'm again, I'm a developer. From, what, from my observation, it feels like the developers seem to be all gung-ho with like yeah these new things we can change and there'll be improvements and they don't have any concerns at all and it's all the the commoners like myself who are like don't change bitcoin uh I, you know I, I i find a difference with i mean i appreciate bitcoin's community's resolve i mean i was i think any litecoin you find was a bitcoiner and um and they still are a lot of them and so i i think that we've had this interesting what I'll call centralization with Charlie and the foundation. Um, but I would say it's been, I mean, it's been fairly voluntary, right? There hasn't been a lot of fight. There hasn't been a lot of uh, reason to not trust that he's been pointing us in the right direction. I think this upgrade is a difference maker uh, versus really any other major, we'll call mm -hmm. blue chip coin at this point, right? A top readily available and highly liquid coin. Yeah. available and uh what i see it is it's, it's a benefit to the users and what i what i'd like to what i like about charlie and the foundation is that their focus is about adoption and about using the coin and it's not necessarily about how do we build smart contracts so that we can build financial markets to run the world's finances it's like look i want the guy on the street to be able to use it without having to yeah. like stress out about it you know and so, yeah, he's pointed us in the right direction. But I think it's been helpful for us that he, we've had that. And where sometimes Bitcoin's many voices make it difficult to accomplish anything, you know? Yeah, I don't think that's a fair point. Like, I don't know if you've been watching the whole Covenant drama at the moment, which is... Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It's, I, yeah, I find I mean, it it's, oddly, yeah, it's, been it's the toxicity part, right? It's just, yeah, why is everybody going to fight about it? We can just talk I know. about it. <laughs> Like, you know, Bitcoin's history, certainly with like Bitcoin Cash and everything, has been yeah. really big kind of fights in 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 the kind of community about like fundamental directions. And I think you still do have, and I like um kind of call myself a Bitcoin maxi in in some regards, but not to the extremity of like oh I hate all other coins. In the case of like I like the simplicity of Bitcoin, like it's just meant to be this digital form of cash. We don't need yeah. crazy smart contracts and and loads of other stuff built on top. And I I like the fact that Litecoin has taken that approach of like you know we are a payment coin for the world. Although we're, we're about to have efficient. NFTs, just so you know. But oh uh, well, I mean Bitcoin technically has <laughs> NFTs as tax and stuff, but yeah. You know, no. So I think, you know, it's on the kind of protocol level, the simplicity that a lot of these OG coins have used, I think has been really good and just kind of focusing in on like, you know, what, what is the, what is the point basically? So right. I think that is definitely a challenge that Bitcoin has is people do have different views about where, you know, the, the protocol should go and how many new features we should get. But then what the covenants drama has shown and and I think you know Jeremy Rubin's proposal was an interesting one but it did not have consensus 
And so it's got dropped. Like the community kind of said, well, the Bitcoin dev community at large said, you know, we're not quite sure about this. There was talk of like user resisted soft forks, user activated soft forks, minor yeah. activated soft forks, all of this. But fundamentally, there wasn't consensus on something and it hasn't come through. And so even though there are a lot of voices in, in Bitcoin, especially, but you know, that's the beauty of a consensus led decentralized network that unless you have consensus, this thing will not come through. So I do think that has been quite powerful in what has been a, a, a debate across whether covenants at all should come in, let alone the activation method. Yeah. And that's, and that's a little bit of, um, you know, off topic of MWeb here, but, you know, just, I think in general, you know, I've had people in my spaces and if you, you, you should come, well, they're very late at night for you, you <laughs> but, um, you know, I get people in there from all different communities and I'm okay with whatever. And I, I have a guy, actually one of the guys who asked, has a bunch of questions he sent me and he's very pro privacy. And he's like, you know, if, you know, if you're not having fundamental privacy, the base layer is a Monero, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay, well, if that's for you, then go do that. Like, that's okay to me. Like, I think yeah. that the idea that, uh, Hey, Bitcoin, if you want Bitcoin to consume everything, you're going to you're going to have to sacrifice yeah. some of the foundational things of bitcoin and i don't think that's a worthwhile sacrifice you're yeah. better off saying like i've got my core foundational beliefs that i'm a bitcoiner but if i want to go do smart contracts and nfts i'll just go use one of these other platforms it's okay like the world doesn't have to run yeah. on bitcoin you know and it you know it's just a trade off and i just think people need to accept that that um it's and it's some sort of desire for number go up and it's some sort of tribal mm -hmm. ego thing. I don't know what the heck it is, but anyway, we could yeah. talk all day about max. We could, and that's like you know, that's the beauty of of <clears throat> kind of cryptocurrencies. Like like Litecoin was a fork of Bitcoin. It wanted to do things a bit differently. Yeah. So it forked off and now we have this other wonderful coin and community. So, you know, that that's the origins of how this network started as well as many others. Like if you disagree cool fork off and, and try and like create your own power <laughs> literally <laughs> fork off right yeah fork off, buddy. <laughs> fork, off <in> <laughs> fork off and build your own thing all right i'm gonna try to ask his questions from this guy let me see if i can get it um you might have already answered him okay is sending or receiving litecoin to mweb or vice versa see this is the well, never mind we had this argument verse or vice versa seamless on the user experience just like it would be mweb to mweb so we're gonna have to find that out you and i disagree on that yeah gonna, i'll think, ask david about that yeah definitely i mean david will know so much more than me i'm just like you know as uh it's like a nice term in the industry now but i'm like a pleb trying to figure it all out so i think as soon as this is activated and we start to see like how people are using it what tooling is created we'll really see how easy it is to it's do a, it's, um, 10 day, it's 10 days away oh yeah i know i'm so excited it's gonna be like <laughs> There's been various, um, like when Taproot was activated on Bitcoin, I was very much like watching uh, the block height change. And there's been other like like big milestone moments in the industry where I've literally like been watching YouTube videos of like the countdown and stuff. So I'm really excited to see this. And this is big. I really start seeing like people use it because it is, it's huge. Like this is one of the first times that we've seen a massive crypto like litecoin is one of the ones that people know when you talk to people new to the industry and you say you know what cryptos have you heard of they say you know bitcoin uh ether that they nearly always call ethereum ethereum is the blockchain ether is the cryptocurrency oh, i call it ethereum. Gi i'm sorry no it drives me mad <laughs> two different things uh utxo blockchains make it easy currency and blockchain are called the same um but yeah i think you know litecoin is such a big uh, cryptocurrency that everyone kind of knows and it's doing a really fundamental privacy shift and so it's going to be really interesting to see like do people use it do exchanges get freaked out and call it like a privacy coin do they change their yeah. attitude towards it like we don't know well, so, yeah um, i guess you know charlie supposedly went out before they did all this and talked to all the exchanges and explained what the plan was and I, my, my, percep my perception is they're not going to adopt mimblewimble like they won't make mimblewimble readily in and out they're not going to have mimblewimble addresses and all that jazz yeah but you might find ones like cake wallet they've, they've kind of committed as soon as they can implement it they will um i think it's going to be difficult to do mobile at first so i yeah. wouldn't get like hey the volume's not going to be off the charts in the beginning but i think some dexes will do it um yeah definitely. i'm really i'm a big fan of i bring them up all the time i should buy i should buy more than i have is thor chain i think thor chain's doing some cool stuff and if they had a place where you could, 
use a Mimblewimble address, like that's a very cool, uh, that would start making a big difference. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be the big thing in terms of adoption. Like, how do we make this easy to use? Because as we've just talked today, like it's pretty complex, the tech, and there's lots of new words. And, you know, I've read the lips and, and there's still things that I don't understand or have misunderstood. You know, Dave, mm -hmm. please tell me where I've misunderstood. I would, li I would literally love that if he was like, by the way, Tara, this was right, this was wrong. Yeah, this amazing. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll to send it more. to him and he can yeah. maybe if he has time. And so um, I think that's what's like really needed. And in this space, in this particular space, but like crypto more broadly, we need to make it easier for people to use so then they can adopt it. And where we have like complex terminology and, and just things that are different to what they might have used with like Bitcoin or Litecoin on an exchange, we need to just kind of handhold people through this process so they don't get confused, they don't do it wrong. And crucially, they don't get scammed. Like the last thing we want is people trying to use Mimblewimble extension blocks and scam people and be like, hey, send it here to enter an extension block. And that just is their like scammy address. So I think that's one to keep an eye on as well as this kicks in in a couple of days to just like make sure we don't uh, like allow people in the space to start trying to scam people because we want it to right. be a safe space for new people and those that have been in the space for a long time. And so, you know, it's on all of us to make sure if we see people trying to scam and trying to steal funds from people in the space we kind of call it out and and right. make sure that no one falls foul of that yeah the big the big thing right now is it's only going to be on litecoin core to start um so here, here's this guy's whole question he said you know if you know mweb to mweb or core to mweb and he said if i'm pegging coins in mweb and then i go to somebody that's a merchant and they have just a core address so this would be the inverse of what you're talking about. Instead yeah. of going in, but going out. Again, the recipient's wallet, I'm, the recipient's, yeah, the recipient's, uh, I guess, wallet or node or core wallet, they'll have to have the core wallet that is updated to M1, MWeb enabled. Otherwise, it will not recognize your address. Like you'll go yeah. to send it and it'll say not valid or something like that. Yeah, so you can only use MWeb functionality if you have upgraded your node and if you're using like MWeb compatible tech. So for your average node in the space, what it will see is it will see like, oh, if it's not upgraded, it will basically see like, oh, something's kind of like going somewhere, but I can't kind of see what else is going on. So when, if you're going to be sending funds into MWeb, out of MWeb, if you're going to be doing stuff within the extension blocks themselves, you have to be upgraded to this technology and you have to be mm -hmm. using Mimblewimble um, kind of protocol technology. Otherwise, it's just going to show us, like, what are you doing? I have I have no knowledge of this thing. I, well, I yeah, it's like, like, it's like if you try to send a bit, if you send, use a, you know, you go to use your Litecoin address and you fill it in with a Bitcoin address, yeah. it's going to say, I don't recognize this as an address. Exactly. So there, there's yeah. no risk. There's no risk of like losing coins in that scenario. I think that's. Oh, important. well, there could always be a risk. Like, I suppose this is new tech. We don't know. Like, <laughs> All right. You're right. You're right. You know, it's been robustly tested, of course, but and it's been on the test net since like, what, 2019 or something. But there's always chances that once it goes into mainnet, someone will find whether maliciously or accidentally <laughs> some way right. that it can go wrong. Oh, God. Come on, what do you guys say? That? That's what it's that's what it's, it's exciting, <laughs> hey? Like innovation comes with dangers and opportunities. Okay, so here's another one he asks. So with Zcash sealed addresses, shielded addresses, or Zcash, you just have one address only. With MWeb, the default method is to accomplish no address reuse. And it's to generate a new MWeb address each time. Or is there a static address? Or you don't Good question. Yeah. So on um, Zcash, you have, as we talked about, these shielded addresses, although it's actually worth saying that within the new five upgrade, uh, which is NU5, um, they're going to be introducing these things called, um, oh, what's the name of them again? Um, Z, they're basically, they're like Z addresses, um, univer unified something addresses, which act as both shielded and transparent. So there is a bit of a change there actually coming uh, than just the typical shielded and transparent addresses. But with MWeb, in my understanding, and Dave come in and like confirm this when, when a slash if you listen, uh, there's the MWeb addresses or LTC MWeb prefix addresses, which represent uh, the funds going into and out from an extension block. But once you're in the extension block, there's going to be no 
addresses and the way that we currently think of them. So that um, instead you're going to be generating these signatures, um, which will be related to uh, public keys because all of this uses elliptic curve cryptography. These like beautiful curves uh, that look like that. Uh, it could, it could be. He kept calling them. Um, he kept using the phrase um, stealth addresses. And maybe so that's stealth a... addresses are um, a term that's used on Monero. So they're a certain type of address on Mon of the address on Monero, which allows you to basically see the activity happening if you have the key uh, related to these stealth addresses, mm -hmm. but they don't exist anywhere in and of themselves that you could just kind of type them into a block explorer or go on a block explorer and see them. So they're only... Okay. Think of it like um, trying to find a Harry Potter reference here. It's like everything's wearing this like invisibility cloak. And um, when you like peek under the invisibility cloak, you can see like what's under there. Is there a pile of books? Is there a TV? Who knows? And you can only peek under there and see it. Uh, or you can only see if you're like peeking under there with a stealth address. It's kind of like hidden. And it's only when you have the key to that stealth address that you can see what activity is going on. You kind of okay. look under the invisibility cloak. So, yeah, because I, I, I'm i going to have to go back and re-listen. Maybe, you know, we usually re-listen to the second Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. Podcast. I'm going to, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm the link. I'm going to have a look after this because my my understanding, which I've absolutely could be wrong, of course, is that once you're within the extension block and doing these transactions, there are no addresses. That's not like a thing that will exist within the uh, extension block world for Mimblewimble. Instead, there'll just be transactions, which are inputs and output amounts, this kernel, which kind of connects it all, and is this like um, multi-party signature, um, but there's no like addresses that, as we would normally see okay. with an LTC or an LTC one or right. an MWeb okay. one. So it might just be some different representation of that, because yeah, um, I yeah, this is definitely something because I, I put nice. something out recently. Yeah. I I what I thought about was cool was the ability to post a public address. Um, pu publicly post your MWeb address, because and this is. You know, we shouldn't even say more because I don't know. What he was saying yeah, is like, you'd have this one address, I love but like behind it, stuff. he would say like you'd visibly see an address, but behind it, every time you sent to it, it would go to a different address. I mean, it was it a might weird... be that that's the, so in like public private key cryptography, which is the, the, the mathematics uh, behind kind of address generation. And this is the same on like normal uh Litecoin as well as like Bitcoin, for instance, what you're doing is you're generating um, to have this thing, you have an address and then you have a private key. So the private key mm -hmm. is the password to spend the funds and the address is um, like an email address that you share with anyone to receive the funds. Now, underneath the address, you have something called a public key. And so what you're doing is um, the math behind it. You basically start with a private key. You do a load of math bouncing around this elliptic curve and then you generate um, the public key from the public key you then use surprisingly a bunch more maths uh use like sha 256 as an algorithm and ripe md 160 and that then creates this public um kind of or the this more like publicly understandable version right. which we call an address so um you have this private this private key which you must keep secret you have a public key which is again a string of numbers and letters and then from that you create the address my understanding and again it could be wrong so I'm very <laughs> this, we're getting um, it we're, you're coming back you're, you're gonna come back uh, yeah i would love to be like corrected and, and be super up to date on all this but my understanding is that you're using these public keys to create um, and create signatures relating to them to kind of prove like, yes, this is my funds. Um, and so whilst the public key might be shareable, there's no such thing as an address within the okay. Mimblewimble extension okay, block. That may make now, sense. of course, it is possible, and this is what we do on like Bitcoin and Litecoin, we could create an address format from that public key, but within the Bitcoin world and the Litecoin world, we have standards of what the address looks like. So we use our SHA-256, RipeMD to create standard addresses whether it's like a pay to uh, pub key hash or a pay to script hash whether it's like a batch 32 address so but all of these things are very standard like you've got a number of kind of templates you can use and you can't go outside of that but in mm -hmm. the mweb world if we don't have those templates then if i'm creating a batch 32 address from the public key but you're creating or expecting a pay to witness script hash that is not compatible so we okay. have to make sure that we have those or we would have to make sure we had those standards. And because as far as I know, we don't have any of those standards. We're working in the, the public key world, which is why we don't have these addresses. Gotcha. But again, 
could be completely wrong. <laughs> <we're excited laughs> well, if you it. are, if no, I, I might do that. I might see if he come on because I, I certainly need, I think it'd be interesting to hear you guys talk through it or some questions you have, or I don't want to get, maybe it'd be too technical, but maybe <laughs> you'd help me out. All right. Let me see if I got one more on here or not. Um, yet yeah, maybe the last thing is, cause this was always a concern is the inflation potential of inflation, right? Like what are, do you know what the steps are that they took to ensure that there is no um, risk of that inflation? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, the short answer is a shed ton of maths, <laughs> basically. Okay. Um, and the good thing is there's a lot of um, there's a lot of kind of prior knowledge that can be built on from this in terms of like Monero and Zcash, et cetera, because when you're in the privacy world, the last thing you want is for under the, the cloak, the invisibility cloak, for someone to just be multiplying this money everywhere. So... Mm -hmm. The way we protect against this in uh, the M-Web world is by having these pegging in transactions uh, relating to the um, integration transaction. So every pegging in transaction has to have uh, an integration part going uh, into the M-Web world. So if you peg in 10, you then create 10 and those numbers have to match. When you peg out, we've got to make sure uh, that the pegging out amount matches to the output address that you're sending. And the activity happening within Mimblewimble isn't just kind of, it's not like an like an optimistic roll up where anyone can kind of do anything. And then if someone finds something fraudulent, then kind of shit hits the fan and we all start thinking like, oh my God, what happens in Mimblewimble is on the Mimblewimble protocol. And within the Mimblewimble protocol, there is, as I say, a load of maths to make sure that no one is just creating money out of thin air. So when we have this Mimblewimble transaction, that's made up of inputs and outputs. Although the everyday person can't see the amounts, actually there's you know range proofs that are happening um, and we're checking the kernels to make sure that no one is just creating more money within that transaction. So if the inputs are 10 and the outputs are uh, 10, then we know that it's zero. But if the inputs are 10 and the outputs are 20, well, something's going on here. So we have um, these things called, uh, I think you pronounce them, Peterson or Ped Peterson commitments again I don't know mm -hmm. it's a bit of math uh, and that basically is checking that the sum of the inputs is the sum of the outputs very standard maths it sounds pretty simple uh, but right. what we're using behind uh, these commitments is making sure and it, again it uses like elliptical curve elliptic curve cryptography uh, which is this like beautiful little curve that is a load of uh, maths that basically everything in crypto is built on. Um, and what we're doing is making sure that if we've got, uh, actually I'll give a really simple example. So uh, three plus five equals eight. Um, and we know that six plus two equals eight. So I can have two sides of an equation, three plus five and eight plus two, both sides equal eight. So mathematically mm -hmm. we know that is sound. Now if I times both sides by 10, that's still mathematically correct because it's 10 times this thing that's true times 10 times this other thing that's true. Now, you don't need to be a PhD mathematician to check that's true. Now, if instead I say 10 and I just put X on both sides, we also know that's still true as long as the X on both sides is the same X. And so we're able to use uh, what we call this blinding factor, in this case X, to multiply both sides and we still know that both are true. Now, let's say the three plus five and the eight plus two, I'm just going to hide that from you for a second. So you mm -hmm. can't see those actual values, but you know that it was true before. I'm just hiding them now. I'm putting some kind of black um, like or some tip X over them. But the numbers underneath are still true. We've got this binding uh, blinding factor of 10. So the maths is still true there. We can be sure of that. And what we're doing when we have these um, Peterson commitments or however you pronounce it, I have no idea, hopefully. Maybe I'll Google it later and see how you pronounce it uh, with some like math lecture. I'm sure they get the idea. Yeah, but um, what we're doing is we're having this ra random blinding factor, this X that we're timesing something by, but we still know that underneath those, the mathematics of that is correct. So you're kind of checking the inputs equal the outputs with this blinding factor to make sure that you can't actually see how much uh, the inputs and outputs are. And so that's basically like the maths. It's a bit more complex, but fundamentally right. that's the maths that's going on underneath is kind of number on this side is the same as number on that side. We're using this blinding factor to hide what, those numbers are so you can't see the amounts and that's what 
makes member Wimble powerful because you can't see the amounts and we don't have addresses because instead we're using these signatures. So you're kind of hiding everything, but the maths underlying it is making sure that it's correct. And that's what's going on in member Wimble. Like the member Wimble protocol in and of itself is a shed ton of maps that make sure that no one can create or destroy anything. The extension blocks is how we're able to tap into member Wimble. The pegging in and pegging out is how we move funds into our member Wimble extension blocks and out from, but there is a whole load of maths going on in member Wimble to protect against people creating or trying to say destroy uh, Litecoin. That was a really long answer to quite a simple no, question, but the answer is maths. There's, there's a, maths to make I'm sure, sure there's some that math majors funny. that found that. <laughs> no, no I've, I've seen something like that. I've watched a YouTube video trying to explain what you're talking about with the ability to know the, there's an underlying truth if you... Yeah, and this is what I'm like doing some um, other calculations. To maybe give people a bit of confidence that there's no kind of crazy wizardry here. Like this is uh, very, very similar maps um, to what's happening in Monero and Zcash as well to make sure that no one's like inflating the supply there. So that's how you know we ha we use this maths to have trust within other privacy preserving protocols, uh, and certainly in like Monero where you can't see anything, that is super important that the maths mm -hmm. is really like solid because the last thing you want is someone doing a load of like crazy inflation and Monero you're using it expecting it to be fine and someone's just printing money so okay. yeah but you know don't we always say in crypto like don't trust verify so feel free to go and verify the maths but um yeah it's quite nerdy so I suppose you have to kind of trust <laughs> I'm gonna, tr the I'm gonna to trust that you did it I'm gonna trust that David did. see there yeah <laughs> everybody has some level of trust they say don't trust but I'm using these things and I don't know how they work I mean I have, I have a general understanding of what the function is but I don't know what's going on so do you have anything else you want to cover or like that you want to let people know about? I mean, I've, I've told, tell people to follow you on Twitter. Do you yeah, like Twitter a or uh, LinkedIn. So we talked a little bit um, before we actually came on air and I was yeah, about my kind of writing. So um, mm -hmm. I try and uh, kind of decode tech a little bit. So I try and write a bunch of pieces, basically simplifying some of the tech that's happening across the space. So um, I never expected my Mimble Wimble piece to kind of <laughs> garner the, the interest that it has. I was just really interested in in how they were doing it with extension blocks versus uh, Grown and Beam's kind of native implementation. So I just like wrote that piece, posted it on LinkedIn, thinking like maybe like one or two people will read it. Uh, <laughs> and then suddenly like Charlie Lee liked it and the official like well, it said it's kind of it out. Desert. I was like, Whoa. Well, so there was, I don't know if you saw when I posted about our interview today, there's a guy, Master LTCBTC on Twitter. He said, hey, do you want to come write for us? Because he has a website called Look Into Litecoin. And they're always looking for writers. So if you'd want to put your content on there, we would. Gosh, eat that yeah. Stuff up, I mean, know? I'm just, yeah, I'm not like a Litecoin expert at all. Like my kind of background is is Bitcoin. So like I say, they're like, I, I don't even feel I'm like technically they're, qualified well, to have this conversation today. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, they're <laughs> the I mean for, again, from my understanding, they're, I mean, they're essentially identical in every way except for the faster block times, the 84 million, and it's a different hash algorithm. It's script instead of SHA-256. Outside of that, they function <laughs> almost identically, except, you know, Litecoin's faster, much cheaper, and has never been, has 0% downtime, unlike Bitcoin. <laughs> but, you know, that's just me. <laughs> so at, so my final question for you. So we all, we consider, like, so there's a small B Bitcoin, right? Yeah. A, a Bitcoin is a, uh, what you might call a fork or, some sort of end result using that Nakamoto consensus. And so you could have ones like Bitcoin and Litecoin and Bitcoin Cash and even Dogecoin could be considered a Bitcoin, small b Bitcoin. So Litecoin, is it a better Bitcoin or is it the best Bitcoin? No, I love that question. <laughs> it's a different Bitcoin. Oh, come on. <laughs> so All I right. mean, they're, no, like, I'm just they're two different I'm... things, right? So if you want, if you want, <laughs> quicker transactions then litecoin is definitely an option you could also if you want a quicker transaction i suppose use like stella or ripple i'm not saying you know any of those are whoa, good or better examples whoa, but whoa, like, whoa, if you whoa. want something quick I'm you've out. got your option i'm out though yeah. stellar is nothing like litecoin i know but what i'm saying is like it depends, <laughs> on, depends what you want so if you want to use like bitcoin and you want to make use of Bitcoin only functionality, then that's a great blockchain for you there. Yeah. If you want to use something a bit quicker or cheaper, you've got other options. Litecoin is obviously one of those options. Right. Um, and so I couldn't possibly choose between all of the various <laughs> options that you have. Like, 
choosing a favorite chart, I suppose. If you're um, going to buy a cup of coffee, use Litecoin, right? Or, or Bitcoin easy. on the Lightning Network. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of steps. <laughs> that's a lot of steps to go through. No. Yeah, true. Okay, there's no one winner, is there? Like, and that's what I really love, like, about crypto, and and why, like, I use the term like Bitcoin Maxi, but try and like fight against that, like, one coin to rule them all. Like, I'm right. very bullish on a multi-coin world. Now, while it won't have loads of the kind of crap coins that we have right now, so many of those will burn off because they don't have real use cases. They don't right. have notable adoption. But you know, Bitcoin being gold, Litecoin being silver, Ethereum being used for all sorts of other like. ERC-20s and native Ether, you know, a lot of them have different use cases and, and benefits. And I think we'll see, you know, those protocols surviving into the future. Many, we definitely won't. But I do see a strong future for Litecoin. And I do really love, and that's why I wrote the article on it, I love the fact that Litecoin isn't just following Bitcoin's implementations. It's like, oh, I see you with Taproot over there, but I raise you Taproot and Mimblewimble. Like, right. that's cool. Like, I love the fact that um, Litecoin's trying other implementations and stuff like that. So, okay. I, yeah, I do find it a very exciting chain. I do, you know, clearly follow it uh, with some interest. Okay. All right. Before we go, because I'm about to go, that's just a really quick question. Are you, is Lightning Network like your thing? Are you no, really? So no, Into so actually, I, like until fairly recently, I was like a li not negative, but skeptical about the Lightning Network because it just hadn't had like the adoption people wanted. And it was only at Bitcoin 2022, the conference in Miami last month, where I listened to kind of more of the core devs speaking. And I was like, oh, OK, like you actually are doing quite a lot of development on this. Maybe I should give it a second look. So and then I went to El Salvador, which is like super based on um, yeah. like lightning network payments so I, like i can start to see the use case a bit more so I've, it's kind of like op i'm open to it now a bit more than yeah. i was previously and, and kind of interested to see where it I was goes just curious if you were becoming an expert i'm finding it hard to find people who are like willing to get into the weeds on it because oh, i'm definitely not an expert gosh no yeah. definitely not and it's uh yeah i, I think i mean i, I think lightning is going to have its place for sure um, no doubt. Yeah. But, okay. Oh, it definitely will. And that's what's exciting. Like there's so many of these technologies and so many new ones and, and yeah, we'll see what works and what doesn't, but Hey, like that's, what's exciting about crypto versus the TradFi kind of worlds. They maybe have one innovation over every hundred years. We have <laughs> one every innovation, every hundred minutes. <laughs> yeah. You can't keep up. I know. <laughs> All right. Well, I thank you again for your time. This is more than I expected. So um, I think we covered as much as we can know today. And hopefully I get something set up with David. And if I do, I'll see if it works out. You know, maybe it may be like middle of the night for you. But I, I would excited make about time it. for David. Oh, Becker. I see. Now I understand where I stand, you <laughs> yeah. guys. I say, hey, middle of the night for my Litecoin spaces. Nope. But David <laughs> Burkett will be here. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thanks again, Tara. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. I guess go check her out on Twitter. And she has a LinkedIn page with a lot of different articles. And maybe we can get you writing on Litecoin, look into litecoin.com, but <laughs> you can just share your article there. It's not that it's not like you have to add, do any extra work. So, okay. Thanks. Have a good one, everybody. Uh, see you Wednesday night on the spaces and uh, have a good day. Bye.